So what you want to do ideally is measure, um, you want some way of measuring the properties of this quark gluon plasma. So what you want is some way of constraining the properties. The ideal thing that you would do is that you would shoot a probe in <clears throat> to your medium and you would look at how this probe is modified, it, you know, then you would detect it. So you'd look at how the probe is modified and um, use those modifications to determine the properties of the medium. So if you guys have ever done um, visual spectroscopy in a chemistry lab, that's basically what you do. You shine light through a sample, you look at how much is absorbed, and you use that to determine the concentration of some chemical in, um, in your um, little sample. That's kind of what we would ideally do, except that the problem is that the quark gluon plasma lives one to 10 Fermi over C, which is about 10 to the negative 23 seconds. So you can't shoot an external probe in. And the other thing is it even happens that it, it is roughly transparent to light. So you can't use light. So you want to use some type of, uh, you can't use an external probe. So what you do instead is that you use an internal probe. And the probe that I'm going to talk about is something called jets. So you have a quark or a gluon in one nucleus, and it hits a quark or a gluon in the other nucleus. And the majority of these collisions are what we call two to two, meaning that you have a quark or a gluon come in and it scatter, they scatter off of each other and you end up with two, um, two quarks or gluons going out. Um, and then if you have one of those, um, this is, this is kind of nice because at least in the cartoon picture, um, one of them acts as a probe and the other can act as a control. So you can end up with a geometry. So one is absorbed, is modified significantly, the other one flies out. Um, and you sort of have a built-in probe and a built-in control. Sounds nice in principle. The devil's in the details. Um, and then you run into another complication, which is that you do not actually see quarks or gluons in your detector. Um, so because of a property, property called confinement, um, if you have a quark or gluon um, flying out, um, <clears throat> let's take uh, this, let's say you have a pion, so a meson, a quark, anti-quark. As you pull them apart, um, it becomes more energetically favorable at some point to create another quark anti quark pair than to pull them apart farther and farther. So the strong force is like a rubber band. Um, it's, it's weak at very short distances, but it, it gets very um, it gets very large at um, long distances. So what that means is that you never see one of these quarks alone. You always see them bound with something else. So if you have a case like this where you have a quark and an anti-quark scattering off of each other, as they come apart from each other, you actually start forming additional quarks and anti-quarks, which means that you're forming hadrons. Um, so if you have this process where a quark and a, where a quark or anti-quark or gluon, um, we call these par partons, so a quark or a gluon inside of a nucleus or inside of a nucleon, is um, called a parton. And <clears throat> when you have this parton scattering, um, they will form something called a jet as these two quarks move apart, as these two partons move apart from each other, they form a spray of hadrons along the direction of the quark. Um, so instead of seeing a single particle, what you actually see is two collimated sprays of particles. So here you can see a dijet event in the star detector where this is the beam pipe. So the, um, the incoming protons are going in opposite directions in and out of the, the screen. And then here you see one spray of particles here and one spray of particles there. So you had, um, you had some type of back-to-back -back collision. 
uh, you know, back to back um, outcoming jets. Now, that all sounds well and good when you have proton proton collisions, where if I tell you that the picture on the left has two jets, um, so two collimated sprays of particles going in opposite directions, uh, you're going to believe me because um, you can see it by eye. The picture on the right is a heavy ion event display from the STAR experiment, and we are going to try to find jets in that. So it's messy. Figuring out which particles are part of the jet and which are not is hard. So um, here, this is actually sort of an event display from the Atlas experiment. So you have, this is from a peripheral collision. And this is the direction, the azimuthal direction. So if you wrap, if you wrap this picture up along this direction to make a tube, that would, um, that's roughly what you'd see wrapping it around the ALICE detector. This direction with the eta on the axis is along the beam pipe. So what you see here, in a, and then on the Z axis, this is the amount of energy detect, observed in the detector. And this is the raw output from a calorimeter. So it's just um, total energy in different powers. So what you see here is that you have, if you eyeball this, you'll see that these two, um, these two bumps are about pi radians apart from each other. So that's saying that along the direction of the beam pipe, you have roughly two um, jets and they're roughly back to back. This is what you see in a peripheral collision. Here you see the same thing for uh, um, a central heavy ion collision, and you see one big tower, um, one, one big bump, where you have one jet, but you're missing the other jet that should be about 180 degrees away. You sort of see a warm spot. This phenomenon is called jet quenching, and we think that what is going on is that one of the jets um, in this case has been sort of near the surface, the way that this picture, this cartoon is drawn, and the other travels through the medium, and it reaches almost, to the extent that it's valid to talk about, it almost reaches equilibrium with the medium, so you don't see it anymore, except maybe a little warm spot. And we want some way to quantify this, and the simplest way is something called the nuclear modification factor. Um, and what this is, is that you take the number of particles. So let me see if it's going to, all right. So this part right here, this is what we call a spectrum. And this is just, if you plot PT and then the number of particles, you will get a spectrum. And it is, in any typical collision, it's roughly exponentially falling. So I have put it on a log scale on my little sketch here. Um, <clears throat> and you are going to, this RAA is the ratio of the spectra in heavy ion collisions to those in proton-proton collisions. There's different normalizations you'll see here, and I probably should tweak my slides so they have it um, so that it's a somewhat consistent not notation. This, is, this sigma is basically a normalized spectrum. It's called a cross-section. Um, and then there's this factor, TAA, is another normalization. So that you take the spectrum in proton-proton collisions, and scale it up by the number of nucleon-nucleon collisions. So proton-proton, proton-neutron, and neutron-neutron. Um, and that gives you a sort of prediction where if heavy ion collisions were nothing but a bunch of nucleon-nucleon uh, collisions, RAA would be one. Um, and um, you can also continue the analogy here to spectroscopy, to absorption spectroscopy, that um, so if RAA is one, then nothing interesting happens. If RAA is less than one, you have suppression. 
If RAA is greater than one, you have enhancement. And you can also, so here there's a lot of messy stuff um, where what you expect at low momenta is hard and complicated. Um, so sometimes when I'm giving a talk, I will draw a dragon here, like on the old maps, and say, here be dragons. Um, we usually focus when we're talking on, about RAA on this high momentum part where it's easier to interpret. And then a lot of what we're looking at here is for some indication, we're, we're looking, we expect suppression. So here you can see this nuclear modification factor or RAA. You'll hear it, you'll hear both terms used um, <clears throat> as a function of momentum. What you see in the red and the pink is two different <clears throat> measurements of hadrons. They are charged hadron measurements from CMS and from the ELISE experiment with the same energy at the Large Hadron Collider. <coughs> what you see in blue is <coughs> um, the nuclear modification factor in proton-led collisions, where to first order, we do not expect the production of a quark gluon plasma because we don't expect to get densities that high. I'm gonna put an asterisk by that. There's a lot of discussions in the field about whether or not we actually might have a quark gluon plasma, <clears throat> but we're not going to delve into that here. So <clears throat> what, and then the green are photons. So this is, we talked about photons at low momenta, so low energy photons, and those are roughly like black body radiation. So here you'll notice the photons on this plot are only um, high momentum because only at high momentum do we think that you are um, well above that, that thermal photon, those thermal photons. And what you see is that your controls in proton lead collisions and, in, and for photons, the control is roughly consistent with one. And what we conclude from that is that we think that we understand this observable. So um, that, you actually have, um, it, if you have something, so the, the photons are basically, the quark gluon plasma is roughly transparent to photons. So these photons should be shooting straight through the quark gluon plasma and we see that they are. And then you see that when we have a quark gluon plasma that there is a lot of suppression. That is sort of RAA in a nutshell. Um, and then there are a lot of details. So you will notice in this plot that you will notice that I have this one of these plots on my t-shirt. Um, the one on the left is called the Phoenix t-shirt plot. And the idea is that you want all the physics measured by the Phoenix experiment in a way that you can fit it on a t-shirt. Um, so that this has a bunch of additional details. So what you see here in the orange are direct photons, but at relativistic heavy ion collider energies. And then this rainbow of other points is just a bunch of other colored probes. So a bunch of different other hadrons. And what you see is that everything, if you get up at sufficiently high momenta, everything except the photons are suppressed. And this is an analogous plot from, with data from the Large Hadron Collider. The orange are, um, are photons and the colors, the colored points are all quarks, or are all final state hadrons so that they have quark, their quarks and gluons in them, they're colored probes, and the quark gluon plasma is roughly opaque. Now, you'll notice that the x-axis is five times larger at the Large Hadron Collider because it's higher energy, so you make a lot more of, um, of these particles. Let me ask people to chime in if they have questions. So this is sort of one of the more basic ways to get some measurement of jets in heavy ion pollution.
What's nice about it is that it is a very clearly defined observable that you can measure easily experimentally, well, easily in quotes. <laughs> um, it, it is generally what you can measure, the, the measurement related to jets that you can measure with the highest accuracy because you're just looking for the total number of particles. And that uncertainty is generally dominated by this single track efficiency uncertainty. So you guys asked a lot of questions about how you do the tracking and how do you disentangle different tracks and on and on. Those are very important questions and that the, those questions largely drive these uncertainties. Another thing that I would like to point out about these plots is that pretty much every different color, every different set of data points corresponds to at least one student's PhD thesis. So the analyses are hard and it takes a lot of work to get this out. If you guys are working with me, you're going to be working on basically trying to implement these analyses in a program called Rivet and to format the data for a database called HEPData. And it can seem a bit like grunt work, but if you think of it in the back of your head as you're basically taking care of the data that were someone's PhD thesis, um, it, I think, can help motivate you for doing some of that and handling it with care. All right, so <clears throat> another way of doing this um, is something called dihadron correlations. And this was one of the first things that we did at the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider. And we basically did it because it was easier than trying to reconstruct the full jet. Um, so, and the reason I'm talking about, most people do different things now, but a lot of you working, if you're working with m me, I'm going to have you implement some of these in this program called Rivet. Um, so a nice thing about this as well is that it is a relatively straightforward measurement that is clearly defined. Um, and what you do is you look for a high momentum track. So the only um, qualifying feature is that it has to be sufficiently high in momentum. Um, for example, in this analysis, this was a um, four to six GeV hadron, and that defines your coordinate system. So you call that zero, and then you loop over all other tracks. <coughs> in this case, this analysis required that the track was from two to four GeV. And you say, okay, do I have a particle uh, between, here I have a three GeV particle. The difference in angle between them is 90 degrees. So now I'm going to add an entry to my histogram at 90 degrees. And you loop over all particles and do that for all particles in a given momentum. What you see in black is what you get in proton-proton collisions. And what you see then is two back-to-back -back peaks. So that just by looking at a high momentum particle, you see um, evidence that you had two jets in a typical collision. So there's one peak around what you call the trigger particle and one peak 180 degrees away. The blue is what you see in central gold-gold collisions. And what you see is that you still see that peak near the high momentum particle, but 180 degrees away, you've lost pretty much all of that peak. Um, so this was taken as evidence of jet suppression. It's one of the mo most highly cited um, papers in the field. We also didn't have details of the flow background subtraction correct. I went back and checked it, and it turns out that it was actually right, but we got lucky. Um, so, yeah, so this is where I actually went and redid it with our latest knowledge about flow 
and the green and the red are two different approaches to background subtraction. And you see qualitatively the same picture. The blue is an intermediate centrality. So the red and the green are very head on. They're very violent collisions. And that's what was in the previous plot. And the blue is mid peripheral. Now, another thing that you can do is that you can look not only in azimuth, so this is the direction around the beam pipe, but in pseudorapidity, which is the direction, um, the direction along the beam pipe. And there was a question there about um, why do you see, what is the reason for the, um, for the away side um, peak suppression, that is jet quenching. So that as the quarks and gluons travel through the quark gluon plasma, they lose energy. And that's, that's the short picture. What, we, what I think is a more accurate way to think about it is as they travel through the quark gluon plasma, their energy gets redistributed. So, um, in proton-proton collisions, you tend to have more particle, or, sorry, fewer particles, each of them carrying more momentum, and they tend to be very collimated. They're very um, narrow. And then the interactions with the quark gluon plasma, the um, dominant thing that happens is that they emit glue, a gluon or they collide with a medium um, parton. And that leads to spreading out the final particles in the jet. And it also means that you have lower average momentum in each particle. Um, so there's a question. I'm assuming jets were found experimentally first, question mark, not by theory. I, I will admit I do jets, but I'm not really sure about the answer to that question. Um, I would, I would have to go back and look a little bit at the history. What you had is you had a mess of data and eventually they figured it was actually from the number of final state hadrons by looking at the symmetries between these hadrons, <clears throat> they figured out that what you have is actually made up of quarks. Um, and I will admit, I am not really sure who found them, but you could look at the final state products and conclude that it was from outgoing partons. If any of those faculty in the audience know the answer to that question, please feel free to jump in. All right, so if you stump the professor, it's okay not to know it. So that concludes the, um, the basic introduction to jets let me pause there and see if there are additional questions